So let's start out with the International Obfuscated C Code Contest. For those who don't know, this is actually the oldest running contest on the internet. It goes back to 1984. Two engineers were working at National Semiconductor. They were coding in C, hacking the Unix kernel. And one day they both ran into a piece of really obfuscated C, horribly written code. They were comparing notes and they wondered, how far can this go? How far, if someone intentionally tried to obfuscate code, how bad can it really get in C? So one of them hops onto Usenet, which is this bulletin board system that was available in the early internet, and he posts this message, first annual obfuscated C code concepts, and he lists these five basic rules. The first one being that the source code can't be more than 512 bytes. So basically what he was saying is, send me your snippets of crap and we'll read the crap. But something really strange happened. People took the concepts very seriously. They didn't interpret it as give me a piece of junk. Instead, they interpreted it as do something brilliant in a ridiculous way. And since he was actually asking for really short snippets, people would submit one-line programs that were sort of brain teasers. So this is a C program. This is one of the winning entries to an early contest. So you can see it says main print out. So the question is, what does the program print out? So if you sit down and start to analyze this program, you'll notice a few strange things. That first of all, it refers to an array called Unix that's accessed twice, but it doesn't seem to be defined anywhere. And instead of a number, the index actually appears to be a string in both cases. And oddly over here, you see plus a string. We know in Java that means string concatenation, but you can't do that in C. And in either language, you can't do minus a constant from a string. And if you look over here, you'll see it's actually printing the address of Unix. So what does this print out a number or something? What this program actually prints out is hilarious, but I don't want to give it away in case you actually want to try to solve this puzzle. This program was written by David Korn, the guy who created the Unix corn shell, and everyone knows Unix and C are synonymously inter, uh, interrelated. He's a master of C, so he was able to produce this from his advanced knowledge of all the esoteric nature of C. And if you look through the history of who won this contest, you'll see a lot of famous names in the hacker community and computer science and uh, even people who had nothing to do with C, like the guy who wrote Perl, he won the contest twice. If you enter this contest and you lose, your program will be deleted and forgotten. But if you win, you'll end up on the IOCCC webpage, in which case, all these famous hackers out in the hacker community, including people like David Korn, who follow this contest, will see your program so you'll get great exposure if you actually enter and win this thing. So here's another example of a winning entry. You can see it's formatted in a strange way. And this program prints out an approximation of pi. And it does it by computing the, uh, using a sum, it computes its own area. And since it's formatted as a circle, it's able to compute pi. So it's absolutely ridiculous. Here's another program, and you can see that it's become sort of a tradition in the IOCCC to format your entries sort of like ASCII art like this. So in this case, format like the symbol pi. If you look at the code, you'll see the digits of pi throughout. But for some ridiculous reason, it prints out 31,415 digits of the constant E, not pi. Don't know why. <laughs> this is not a winning entry to the IOCCC, but I want to show you this so you understand the slide I'm going to show you next. Above the line is a one-line program in C. Below the line is the output of the program. You can see they match. This is a self-reproducing program, also known as a quine. And if you look at the code, you'll see main print depth, and it's printing out a string. Now, if that string contained the whole program, that would be impossible. That would be an infinite regression, which can't be done. So the program has to store itself in sort of a compressed way and print out the, compre uh, the program uh, expanded. And if you look carefully, the string says main print f. It defines the constant a, like right here, but instead of the string, there's a placeholder. And that placeholder gets replaced by the value of a. So when the string is printed out, it expands out back into the original source code. It's very clever. You can study this in detail later. This is known as a quine. So, but a quine is not enough to win the contest. Certainly not. You have to do something like this. This program here on the left, this face, that's the entry. When you compile and run this, it produces this program over here. You compile and run it, it produces this program over here. Compile and run it, it produces this. Compile and run it, you get back the original face. So it looks like these are Japanese characters. You know, it's truly an international contest. But this is actually four programs. This is known as a quine relay. And it's an extraordinary entry to the IOCCC. So this is actually uh, one of my winning entries. Now every year about a dozen people win, so I'm not saying I'm the, I was the only winner. This is uh, for the 2013 contest. You can see from the, the formatting that it's Tetris related. In fact, if you look closely at the code, here's a bunch of variables, T-E-T-R-I-S right here. It's also a tradition in the IOCCC to try to get the variables in the program to spell out words, and there's actually a bunch of other hidden words throughout. 
And uh, for those who haven't seen, I have a video on my YouTube channel that shows what this program does. Uh, and, and here are some screenshots from that video. So basically, I'm using Tetris as sort of an output device, as a printer. I call it the Tetris printer algorithm. I got this idea while working with uh, post-it notes. And in fact, this video is doing much better on YouTube than my post-it note video. And what you see it does is it animates. It actually builds up those video game characters, you know, uh, cell by cell from the bottom up. So you can hear, see them here in mid-generation. And I have a full web page describing how the algorithm works online. So this program here, this is what Alex and I created. In fact, Alex did most of the work. I just sort of polished it up at the end. What this is, it's a web server. And if you point a browser at the web server, you'll see just a static HTML page, completely boring. But what it actually is, is a secret stealth downloader because this program also runs as a client. And if you connect the client to the web server, it will transfer any secret file that we want over the internet. So we, we found essentially a flaw in the way internet protocols work, and there's a way to actually transfer files in a way that can't be detected. Meaning if you put a, a, a network sniffer on the network, and you looked at all the packets, you record them all to a log and study that log, you wouldn't see what we did. All you would see is the static HTML page, nothing changing at all. You wouldn't even know that we transferred a file over the internet. If I don't maintain the speed, we'll never get through this. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. slow it down. Do you record it? We are recording, don't worry. Anyway, <laughs> as I was saying, anyway, Alex did most of the work on this thing. He, I, I came up with the idea, he did the coding, and in the... Um, in the most recent contest, it began where there was only, uh, you're only allowed to have programs at length, uh, source code length, 512 bytes. But the current contest, where the rules have expanded, there's essentially like five pages of rules now, five pages of guidelines, five pages of FAQs. It's become really complicated. And um, the current size is your program source code has to be under 4K. But there's actually a secondary size limit that says once you subtract out all the white space of the program, it can't be bigger than 2K. But that rule is actually a little more complicated than that. And they created what's called the size tool. You have to run your source code through this, and it prints out the secondary size, and it has to stay under that 2K limit. Now, Alex went through the size tool source code very carefully, and he discovered that there was a bug in it. He put this little thing at the very top called a trigraph in C, and this actually fools the, the size tool. As a consequence, it prints out zero. So he beat the secondary size limit and it allowed us to pack some extra stuff in there, but we also justified it. If you're gonna create a program that's able to you know, download a program in a stealthy way, obviously you want it to print out the size tool of zero also. So we think the judges love that. We don't really know yet. This is not yet posted on the IOCCC page because the judges are still working on their remarks. So when they, they come back, we'll explain the full algorithm on how this thing does its job. Okay, so next. This is... Uh, Hmm? No, actually, in the contest, they, they, want you, they want you to break the rules. They, if you break the rules and you get through, they actually love that. So you can bend the rules, and that's why the rules have gone from five rules to like 15 pages total stuff you have to read to understand the contest. Anyway, this third program, this is my winning entry to the 2006 contest, and this is the one I'm going to focus on today. This is a digital circuit simulator, but for a ridiculous factor, it only simulates the electronics that were available back in 1940. I'll explain why in a bit. Now this program, this is not the complete entry. It actually comes with a lot of other stuff. That first I submitted a very long file like this. This is what the program reads in. It looks like a programming language, but it's actually a hardware description language, meaning it allows you to compose electronic components out of other components. That if you look at the top here, this defines an XOR gate out of some other components. And this strange notation just tells you how to wire things together. It's not meant to be run sequentially like a program. So it reads in a long file like this, and it actually defines in memory this. This is the definition of a virtual computer. It consists of a bunch of registers, some buses, an incrementer, some memory, an arithmetic logic unit, and some control lines. So it builds a full virtual computer in memory. And just like any other computer, it needs some input-output. So I stuck with 1940s technology. And back then, the only output was a printer, so, which is represented by standard out. And to read in the program, I use a virtual punched paper tape reader, because that was the only technology back then. So I write onto my virtual paper tape. I write in bytecodes or machine language. And uh, it, 
when you turn on the computer, it reads this into memory, it actually runs the program. I actually code in this. This is assembly language, which is readily convertible into bytecodes by just using a table. And so because there's such a low level of language, this is only a small snippet of a much larger program. And it always amazes me, even to this day, that I never wrote an interpreter for this language. This language only exists as a consequence of the virtual wiring in the machine. So I just always found that really bizarre that it's really like a language just appeared out of nothingness. And when you run my programs, it generates images like this. So these fractal images. It looks like a graphic, but it's actually just ASCII art. So to recap what the full entry actually was, it's a program that simulates 70-year-old obsolete electronic technology that reads in a hardware definition language that specs out a complete virtual computer that runs virtual punched paper tape that's written in assembly language to print out fractal images. And that's why this thing won uh, for the contest. It's that ridiculous. Now, when uh, I was trying to come up with a name for the hardware description language, I looked to languages like this, Java, Ruby, Logo. I like the fact that it's four letters, two syllables, and every other one's a vowel. And I came up with a lang uh, name for my language, Tofu. And I justified it by saying, well, we have Tofu hot dogs, that's simulated meat, so why not uh, Tofu circuits, you know, simulated hardware. Now, it's a tradition in the IOCCC that they, they actually come up with awards uh, invented just for winning entries. So they came up for me the Edamame Award, which stands for Electronic Design Automation Abstra uh, Mechanical Abstract Machine Emulator. But this is actually a joke in two different ways. That one, anyone who's eaten at a Japanese restaurant knows that Edamame is steamed soy, which is what so uh, tofu is made of. But also the main part is the multiple arcade machine emulator. It's that thing that runs the arcade games from the 80s and 90s. It uh, simulates the processors from those old machines. And uh, so this is actually a brilliant joke that they came up with this. They combined a virtual machine MAME with soy and the whole soy thing. So I love that a completely nerdy joke. Anyway, why did I use 1940s technology? So let me explain. See, back when I was in college, uh, studying computer science as an undergrad, I heard this really strange urban legend. I heard that sometime around World War II, they built one of the first computers. It was, it was a massive machine, something like this, but like you gotta imagine filling up this room in like maybe multiple rooms. So anyway, one day the machine starts to malfunction. Nobody knows what's going on until one an engineer pries off a panel and discovers a moth. Somehow a moth had like crawled up into the machine and its body shorted out a circuit board or something and you know caused the whole machine to malfunction. And ever since that time, any time a computer malfunctioned, whether it was hardware or software, they refer to it as a computer bug. Hence the origin of the word bug and the word debug. But not only that, and this is really important to the legend, we wouldn't have heard any of this, except for the fact that the engineer who discovered the moth was named Grace Hopper, and uh, whose name happens to sound a lot like Grasshopper. Hence permanently associating computers with bugs. So is the legend true? Well, I looked it up and it turns out, yeah, mostly yeah. There was a woman named Grace Hopper, and she did all these amazing things in the early days of computer science, including inventing the language COBOL. And this incident did happen under a watch. In fact, we know when it happened. It happened on September the 9th, 1947, at 3.45 in the afternoon. And we know that because we had the log from that day. There it is. There's the moth taped in. If you look carefully at its right wing, it's actually missing. And to the left, the title of my presentation, Relay Number 70, Panel F, Moth and Relay, First Actual Case of Bug Being Found. Well, that sentence first actual case of bug being found sort of indicates that the word bug did not originate here. It was used in mechanical engineering, like if an engine had problems, they used to say there were bugs in the engine. But Grace Hopper took the word as a consequence of this incident. She used it in her speeches, in her writing, in her articles, books, and so on. She popularized the word, uh, the word bug in computers. So in a sense, the word bug really did originate from here. No one used it for mechanical engineering anymore. Anyway, when I first saw this page, which happens to be on display in the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C., by the way, I didn't care about the moth. I cared about what was to the right of the moth, this relay number 70. I wanted to know what the heck that was about. How did, what did the moth do to this? Why did computers back then have relays? I've never heard of these things before. So this is sort of what got me motivated in this project in the first place. So let me, let me explain to you what uh, a relay is. Well, this is the, of course, the Intel AD86, the microprocessor in the original IBM PC. And if we zoom up on this with a scanning tunneling electron mic uh, microscope, you'll see this. These little stack things here, these guys, these are the transistors. These are the basic elements that make a computer work. If you, they're like the Lego bricks. 
You put them, enough of them together, you've got a computer. Now, this is an integrated circuit, and integrated circuits have only been around since the 1970s. Back in the 60s, they used to build computers like this. Those little black things are discrete transistors, and they're all soldered to these boards, and you need a ton of these boards and huge racks to build up a computer. In fact, if you look at the upper right, ALUC indicates this may be the third card in the arithmetic logic unit of some much bigger machine. Now, back in the 1950s, they did have transistors, but they were way too expensive to build a computer out of. So they had to use a different technology, vacuum tubes. So you can see vacuum tubes are like the size of a small light bulb. And so you can imagine how large a computer built out of vacuum tubes must be. In fact, the U.S. military, back in the 50s, owned 25 computers that were the size of two football fields. And of course, none of those computers came close to the power of like your cell phone that you're currently carrying with you today. Now, what's really interesting is that 10 years prior to this, in the 1940s, they, they didn't use vacuum tubes. They used a different technology, the relay. This is the technology in which the moth interfered with, and it's the same technology I used in my project. I really like relays, that you can see they're, they're smaller and more compact than vacuum tubes. They're uh, much more reliable. They use much less power. But not only that, each relay can do the same thing that two transistors can do. So if you, if you can opt for relay technology instead of transistors, you'll actually use half the parts and all the circuits are actually much simpler. So now what's also really fascinating to me is that it was only in the 1940s that they started using relays in computers. But relays themselves actually date back a century earlier. Let me show you what I mean. This is an image from Samuel Morse's patent for the telegraph. And I think we've all seen the telegraph in movies. You know, you tap on this key and you send out Morse code. Now, it turns out Samuel Morse did not invent the concept of electrical telegraphy. In fact, he was competing against a lot of other inventors of, uh, in his day. But you see, the other inventors were thinking along the lines of sort of like keyboard and remote printer. He, um, he, I guess you could say he applied what we would call today the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. He just used one key, not a keyboard. And to make his one key work, of course, you need Morse code. And I think, again, we've all heard Morse code in like the movies, like anyone who's seen Titanic, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 the SOS signal, save our ship. So it was simple because it was one key and he used this code, but it was also simple electrically that this is the circuit for the telegraph, that what you're seeing here on the left is the symbol for a battery. Here's the key. It has a long wire between the key and the receiver. In this case, I'm just using a light bulb for the receiver. So if you press down on the key, you form a continuous conductive pathway between the battery and the bulb, which happens to be grounded. You release the key, it pops back open like a key on the keyboard, and uh, the circuit's broken and the light turns off. So here, you can see how easy it is. You could tap on Morse code, no matter how long that wire is, between the key and the receiver. But Morse didn't have access to light bulbs. They wouldn't be invented for another 40 years. Instead, he had this. So this, that's the symbol for an electromagnet. Now, I think we've all played with electromagnets. You just take some wire and you wrap it around an iron core. When you fire it up, the iron core turns into a magnet. For some reason, the symbol, they draw the core above the coil, but uh, it's just the electronic symbol for it. And this also has to be grounded for it to function. But the, there's a little problem with using an electromagnet. Uh, a magnetic field is invisible, so you're not going to see this glow red like this. So to make his magnetic field visible, Samuel Morse built this contraption above the magnet. So what you're seeing here is it's a little arm that's able to pivot between these two pegs. Normally a, uh, a spring holds the arm against the upper peg. But when you fire up the magnet, it overcomes the force of the spring, it swings down and hits the lower peg. You turn the magnet off, it swings back. That's simple. But it's actually really important that when the arm pivots and it hits a peg, it has to make a little audible click sound. And when it swings back, same deal, it makes another click. Because it's the duration between those two clicks that tell you which symbol you're transmitting. So for example, a dot would be click, click, and a dash would be click, click, a longer duration. So you'd actually have to listen for those two clicks and focus on the time between them to figure out what you're transmitting. So here you can see it uh, in totality that here's the switch and there's the receiver. So that's, that's, this is essentially the essence of the telegraph that he invented. Now assume for a moment that the key and the receiver are 10 miles apart, so meaning that this wire here is 10 miles long. Let's see what happens now. Hmm. Well, that sucks. The signal doesn't get through. There's a phenomenon in wires known as impedance. It effectively impedes the signal. 
and it becomes significant over long distances. So there's no way a battery is going to reach out 10 miles to hit this magnet. This will not match this in this case. And in fact, a lot of the other inventors of the time ran into this exact same problem. That it seemed like the telegraph was going to be something that can only transmit between, let's say, one building and another. It was never going to reach between one city and another. But Morse came up with a brilliant solution to this problem. So once again, here's a zoom up of his telegraphic receiver with its pivoting arm. And he realized that that device above the magnet kind of resembles a switch. So he attached wires to it and actually made it a switch. So by default, this wire here connects to this wire here. But when we turn the magnet on, now this wire here connects to this wire here. So this switch that can be remote control is called a relay. This is the device that the moth interfered with. Apparently, it was walking along and its wing entered this gap here right at the moment that the computer fired it up, trapping the moth, maybe killing it, and interfering with the operation of the computer. Anyway, so that's great. This is really, but how did this solve the distance problem for the telegraph? Well, let me show you how it's done. Once again, assume that the key and the receiver are 10 miles apart. At the very center mark, at the five mile point, we put a relay. Next, I attach the key to the magnet of the relay. So now this wire is only five miles long. So the signal will be weakened when it travels from here to here, but it should still be strong enough to actually energize this magnet to turn the switch. Next, we connect the receiver to the lower pin of the switch, and finally I connect the battery here. So now when I hit this, when I hit the key, it should send a signal out to this magnet, which will turn this switch, and it will be the second battery that travels the next five miles to the receiver, and that functions like this. So this is actually a brilliant solution. The battery and the relay are acting as a kind of proxy. In fact, it's called a relay because it relays the signal. And it's also sort of acting as an amplifier because it's taking a weak signal in and refreshing it with a strong signal out. So it's a brilliant solution. And you could chain as many of these as you need. You know, if you put one every five miles, you could reach across the entire United States. Now, if we put a box around this, we actually define a new component that has one input and one output. And uh, this component is known, of course, as a buffer. And the logic of a buffer is just whatever is going in is what's coming out, but it also has the property of amplification, which I just mentioned. Now, here's the buffer expanded back out into a battery and relay. What if we took the wire that uh, connects to the receiver, and instead of connecting it to the lower pin, we connect it actually to this upper one. So we get this. It actually is energized even though the key is in the upstate like this. So you can see the key and the receiver are in opposite positions, but when we press the key, they, they reverse, just like this. So this device, if we draw a little box around it, has one input and one output, and we call it an inverter. And the only difference in the symbol is this little loop at the end. So you can see here again that the input is just opposite to the output. So now, using buffers, they built an entire network across the United States by about 1840 would reach coast to coast and they started expanding to other countries. The, the telegraph didn't have much use for the inverter. Both these components have interesting properties. I just want to show you one. If you connect a battery to the wrong end, it won't propagate the signal in reverse. It only propagates in the direction of the arrow. And you can see here the reason for that is that the magnet itself is, is physically separated from the pin, so there's no way the signal could travel in reverse. Now the telegraph network only lasted about 40 years, and the reason is 1876, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. This is the centennial stamp issued by the U.S. Post Office in 1976, and it features uh, an image from this telephone patent. Now just like now, the telephone is only as good as the service provider that you're connected to, and back then, that meant this. So I think it, we've also seen pictures of these old lady operators standing in front of these plug boards with the link cables. Ever wonder what they're doing and how that worked? Well, imagine this is five customers, A through E, and those lines represent the wires going from their homes into the exchange. Suppose A wants to talk to C, the operator would connect a link cable actually just physically connecting A to C, just like that. At the same time, let's say D wants to talk to E, you just connect another link cable. Now, around the turn of the century, all this plug board technology was automated by a man named Almond Brown Stroger. And according to Stroger, he was a funeral director and his business, a business became fully dependent on the telephone. And one day he started to notice the call volume was dropping. He was getting fewer and fewer calls. His business started to suffer. He did a little investigation and he discovered that the wife of his competitor was working as an operator in the local telephone exchange. 
and she convinced all the other operators to direct funeral traffic to her husband. And this infuriated Schroeder. He decided he was going to get them all fired by building a machine to replace them. And somehow he, he succeeded. And let me show you how he did it. So once again, here are the five lines entering in and the plug board with the link cables. So now if you have only five customers, it turns out there's only ten ways to install that link cable. And I've actually listed them all out here. For a machine to have control over these ten possibilities, we have to install these little uh, bow tie things called transmission gates. Now, a transmission gate is just a relay, but it's used in a way you haven't seen before. For example, consider the potential connection between A and B. All we have to do is set up a relay like this. By default, A and B are not connected. You fire up the relay, we've established a connection. Turn the relay off, the connection's gone. So as I just mentioned, the electronic symbol for this looks like a bow tie. That stick at the bottom just represents whether it's on or off. In fact, it looks like a bow tie because it's two arrows pointing at each other indicating that this is, when it's on, it's a two-way connection. And even though it looks like a buffer, it has no internal battery. There's no application going on. It's just, when it's, off, when it's on, there's a connection between A and B. When it's off, there's not. Now, there's always a little a bit more to the telephone exchange. There has to be some sort of mapping that takes a phone number in and energizes the associated transmission gate. But not only that, it has to keep that transmission gate energized for the full duration of the call. But the problem is the phone number is only given once at the very beginning. And it has to memorize the, the, the fact that it has to keep this transmission gate open for the full duration. So in other words, the phone system needs a little bit of, of memory. So to endow it with some memory, consider taking a buffer and a piece of wire and looping it back on itself. It will just sit there doing nothing because the input equals the output, both off. But if you take a battery and touch it to the loop, energizing the loop, and then you take the battery away, you'd find that it remains energized. And the reason is because the input has to equal the output. But if we break the loop and then restore it like this, we end up back in the initial state. So this circuit is stable in two different states. It's called a bi-stable circuit. And hence, it's able to store one bit of information. Now, I'm sure a few of you are looking at the image on the right and saying, that's impossible. That's a perpetual motion machine. You can't do that. But you've got to remember that this is just a shorthand for this. So here you can see this is a perfectly stable circuit, just sits there doing nothing. You bring a battery to the loop, it energizes it, it actually flips the switch. Now you have two batteries touching the loop, which is perfectly fine. You take the battery away, and now you can see it's actually the buffer's own internal battery that keeps it in this state. You break the circuit and restore it to get back to the initial state. So here are the two stable states of the bi-stable circuit and why it's able to record one bit of information. Now, if we look back at our, our phone system, uh, you see I attached this buffer loop to the transmission gate. So when the phone number comes in, we energize the loop and hence energize the transmission gate. The phone number was only given once, and it stays in the state until they hang up. Now, this, all this was invented around the turn of the century, and Bell Telephone set up Bell Labs to further advance the technology and its electronic network. Bell Labs, of course, went on to invent a, a whole ton of stuff, but more importantly, in 1925, they moved right here in Lower Manhattan. Anyone who's walk, walked on Highline Park may actually recognize this building. Trains no longer run here in Lower Manhattan. This whole thing's been converted into a park that you could walk in. This is, yeah, it's an awesome park. This is what it looked like back in 1925. Do you, ever, you recognize the building, by the way? Anyway, this is only one of 13 buildings uh, that they took over, an enormous complex. You've got to think of it. We had like a mini Silicon Valley here in Lower Manhattan, though they moved that long ago. But what really amazes me about their advancements on the telephone network is that back then there was no circuit theory. It was completely an art, not a science. It was sort of a trial and error approach, an ad hoc approach, a cookbook approach, not a science. And, but this all changed in 1937. It took that long. That uh, a, um, an engineer working there had a really important revelation, that he realized that they were working in a binary system. So this is obvious to us today. But no one recognized it until 1937. So by a binary system, I mean if you have no electricity in a wire, that's a zero. If a wire is electrified, that's a one. So this is the inverter that flips the signal. So you could write a little truth table. You could say a zero in gives you a one out, and a one in gives you a zero out. He was the first guy to actually write this truth table for an inverter. Furthermore, he said, what happens if you take two inverters and you tie the heads of those inverters together like this? So this defines a two-input device with one output. And again, you could write up the truth table. So here, a 0, 0 gives you a 1. 
If we attach a battery to the lower inverter, it shuts off, but the upper inverter continues to power the output. So a zero one gives you a one. By symmetry, if we flip the battery to the upper inverter, it shuts off, but the lower inverter continues to power the output. So one zero gives you a one. But if you want no output, you just attach two batteries to both inverters, shutting them both off, and a one one produces zero. So what's the significance of this table? That happens to be the table for a NAND gate. And that's important because in circuit theory, there's a law that says all from NAND, meaning you could synthesize any gate if you could build NAND gates, meaning from two relays, you could build anything. And he knew this, even though circuit theory did not exist in his time, because he studied Boolean logic, a branch of mathematics that was invented about 90 years prior that no one had any application for until this day. So instead of sharing this information with his coworkers, you know, because this looked great on paper, he didn't know if this would actually work. He went home that weekend, he goes into his garage, he finds a bunch of junk, brings it into his kitchen, and he starts to build something. NAND gates are boring, so he decides he's going to build something a little more advanced. This is what he came up with. So what you're seeing here, these cylinders, this is what batteries look like in 1937. Uh, it has two outputs, the NAND gate is only one, and he made his outputs out of these two flashlight bulbs. He wanted two buttons for inputs A and B, but he couldn't find any buttons, so he took a tin can and just cut it out into the shape. These things, these are the relays. It looks like there's two, but it's due to the camera angle. You can't see there's actually four here. There's four relays, two batteries, two bulbs, and two switches. Since he built it in his kitchen, he called it the Model K. I'll tell you what it does in a second, but let me show you where it is now. It's currently sitting in a museum in Silicon Valley. This huge computer museum recently opened up there in 2012. This is a screenshot from a video that when it opened up, they had a press tour down there, this, uh, so there's a YouTube video from it, and they invited this guy, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, to, uh, to help with the press tour. But what they really wanted him to do was stand in front of his Apple I prototype, which recently sold at Christie's for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But he told the press, no, no, forget the Apple I. The real gem of the museum is the Model K by George Stibitz. And he actually, on camera, explained in elaborate detail how the Model K works and uh, exactly what it does, which is absolutely hilarious. But the main, his main point was that all the computer technology in the museum and, and of course the world is derived from this one device, this one weekend project that this guy did. So anyway, let me show you what it does. So here it is, two batteries, two switches, two bulbs. I'll hide the circuits, doesn't matter, you can think of it as a puzzle later. Here's the truth table for it. Here are the four possible inputs. Here's the output. So what does this all mean? If you interpret the output as a two-digit binary number, you have 0, 1, 1, 2. And if you look at the inputs carefully, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. It's an adder circuit. So he shows up to work on Monday with his Model K, and he shows his coworkers, and they don't care. He shows his bosses, they don't care. He shows the execs at Bell Labs, they don't care. They basically tell him, look, we hired you to advance the phone network. Could you please just get back to work with what we assigned you? <laughs> so anyway, luckily for us, <laughs> you see what a weekend project does? No one cares. Like, you. like me. You're <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. But he hounded the execs for an entire year, and eventually we said, okay, fine, you could, you could do something with this. So in that year, he actually came up with some new uh, discoveries. First of all, if you just replicate the Model K and you chain it together, you could add binary digits of any length. And second of all, because of the way negative numbers are represented in binary with two's complement, the same circuit's able to do subtraction. So what about multiplication and division? Well, if you look at multiplication, in this case in base 10, you can see it just consists of repeated addition and shifting to the left. And subtraction involves repeated subtraction and shifting to the right. So he realized that if he could just get it to loop, he could reuse the same circuit for both multiplication and division. And eventually, two years later, 1940, he ends up with this. This is a rack full of about 400 relays, and um, it all just wired together in the back, and it has about the equivalent power as one of these, a four-function calculator. This is not a computer, it's just a computing device. So what was cool is that Bell Labs says, okay, uh, what are we gonna do with this thing? We'll give some demos to like all the colleges around the country. But instead of carrying the machine around, you know, like in a truck, they decided to leave it here in lower Manhattan. And instead they communicated it to it using this. This is a teletype printer. It's a portable device. You can see the green box uh, beneath there. You just load this up, you connect it to the phone line. Normally you connect two of these together and you type on one or print out on the other, so you'd have like a two-way chat. 
And this is actually sort of the invention that Morse's, uh, Samuel Morse's competitors were trying to build in the days of the telegraph. Now it was available in 1940, so they rigged it up so that from any college in the U.S. they could give a demo and they just typed the machine remotely and essentially like telling that into the calculating device. So in one of these demos, they actually had people come up and enter in mathematical expressions to prove that it wasn't something they could try. So a mathematician comes up and tries to fool the machine, he enters one divided by zero to see what would happen. And it was really awesome, it prints out that can't be computed or something to that effect. So they couldn't beat the machine. So this thing really worked. Now back at Bell Labs, they decided, well, we actually better put this machine to use. It cost them a lot of money and research to build it. So they found the most efficient way was to use a punch paper tape reader, like I showed you earlier, though I was claiming it was virtual. This is the real guy. And they, they essentially, they had their engineers encode a bunch of mathematical expressions on one long tape. They feed in the tape at one shot and print out the results. So that it makes sense that that's efficient. But you could see that this was actually the first step in terms of making a machine programmable, that putting out a, a sequence of instructions on tape. And in fact, when, uh, as a consequence, of doing the demo tour to various colleges. It was the colleges that took the next step and actually made a fully programmable machine uh, using this idea. Within four years, Harvard uh, produced this. 1944, the Harvard Mark I computer. Beautiful machine, though you can see it's pretty large. I think it uses something like four times the number of relays. You can see some of the relays are exposed here. And what you gotta do is imagine what this machine must have sounded like. So just like the telegraph receiver, when the switch flips, you hear a little click. It's softer with the relay, but when you have so many thousands of relays, it must have sounded something like crickets while it's operating. You can actually hear the computer think. Anyway, the Harvard Mark I was the predecessor of the Harvard Mark II computer. The computer which in 1947 the moth got trapped in there, the origin of the word bug. So, but the real reason that they were able to invest, invent this thing so quickly was because they got U.S. government funding. Essentially, the military funded all these early computers at various colleges. The reason was World War II broke out, and they told the public, well, we need these machines to, uh, to compute this, ballistics, fire, and cables. So back then, there was no missile technology. Everything was ballistics. And in fact, uh, you know, if you look at the cannons on ships, they were able to launch projectile bombs up to 20 miles uh, in distance from the ship, which is an incredible distance. And for that to land accurately, all those guns had these fine tuning knobs that you would enter in, oh, what's the air temperature, what's the pressure, what's the elevation, and all, all these combinations. And to make that technology possible, you needed these tables. So they would have the computers generate the ballistics firing tables. And this, it was true, the government was using this, but that was really sort of their cover. See, the British were funding computers also, and they were using it in secret for a completely different purpose. They were using it to crack the Nazi codes. Then to the left, you see the famous Enigma and Cipher machine. And this was for getting out encrypted messages to the soldiers out in the field. And to the right, the far more complex Lorenz Cipher machine, which was used for communicating between the different parties in the Nazi high command. So the, both of these were cracked using machines. The, the Enigma was cracked. Uh, you couldn't really say the machine they produced was a computer. But the Lorenz was so complicated that the only way to run the algorithm to crack it was using a computer. And not surprisingly, that computer was built by an engineer named Thomas Flowers, who worked at the phone company. So now, this exact computer here, the Harvard Mark I, was being used by uh, the U.S. military for a completely different purpose. They had a different machine in mind. They had this. They used it to develop the atomic bomb. The physicists working on the bomb, they had different designs that they reduced to mathematical models, and they, they didn't know which one would work, and they ran them all on the computer and determined that some of them completely didn't work, some were inefficient, and of course they used it to find the right one. So if the Harvard Mark I didn't come along when it did, the development of the atomic bomb probably would have taken an extra year or two. And if you think about it, the Harvard Mark I only exists as a consequence of the Model K. So you can think, someone goes home and does his weekend project, and a few years later, we have the atomic bomb, that it really made a major contribution to it. So, and it was something initially that they thought had no use okay, whatsoever. <laughs> Exactly. And you know this building associated to the bomb. They built the bomb. This building? Uh, I don't know the story. Hold it off to the end. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, where's the leaf? So here's the zoom up of a relay. This is the actual device. You can see most of it is taken up by the uh, electromagnet. Here's the switch. You can see how easy it is for a moth to be standing here to get its wing trapped in here. And I think the spring is stored back here. So uh, why don't they use these things anymore? It, well, if you look it up, it turns out in the 1940s, they only built 10 relay computers. 
And the reason is pretty simple. That this switch, when you fire up the relay, it takes 10 milliseconds to switch. The Harvard Mark I was able to do an addition in a third of a second. It took four seconds to do a multiplication and 10 seconds to do a division. So that's the problem with relays. And so they quickly replace them with vacuum tubes. It does the exact thing that a relay can do, the same kind of switching technology. It does it something like 10,000 times faster because it has no moving parts. And again, that's what they did in the 50s and the 60s. They advanced to transistors. It's kind of hard uh, to see because uh, of the coloring of the, the projector. But a transistor has only three wires coming out of it, whereas a relay had four. So that's the reason that a, trans, uh, a relay is able to actually do the job of two transistors. But that's great, uh, you know, uh, it's great except for the fact that a transistor is something like a billion times faster. And when you shrink it down onto an IC, it's now uh, 10 billion times faster. So that's pretty much the end of the story that brings us back to current time. But uh, I do have one more thing to show you. That what you're seeing here is an experiment in nanotechnology. That here you can see the scale, 100 nanometers is this line here. So this little gap here is less than a nanometer. This is a nano relay. This is a relay on an integrated circuit. And just in a macro scale relay takes 10 milliseconds to flip. A nano scale relay can do it in a fraction of a nanosecond. That speeds even faster than the solid state silicon dope transistors that are used in chips today. Now, the thing is that if they manage to get this to work, you'll immediately be able to use half the parts because I said one relay equals two transistors. And they're always talking about Moore's law, which says that uh, they need to double the amount of transistors every 18 months. It's gonna to start to peter out it's because they're starting to shrink the transistors so small that uh, we're getting what's called electrical leakage, that the charges are leaking out of the transistor into the neighboring parts. But this doesn't happen with mechanical switches. So if the mesh gets to work, they'll immediately be able to double the amount of parts on a chip. So I'm not saying this is the future of technology, it's one possible future. And if it's true, then all the crazy circuits that I built for my project, maybe they'll have some use after all. Now, I don't know if this is the future, but I do know a year from now, next IOCCC is not that far away. <laughs> you think you have what it takes, study what's all the other entries online. I encourage you to enter. It was really, it's really fun to participate in a contest like this. Thank you. Basically it. Uh,